So, because we're under a busy schedule and we have to leave the auditorium on time because there's another conference starting tomorrow, so they need the room to be able to prepare it, we're just going to start straight away. But before we come to our final panel session, which is going to be on a roadmap for agroforestry, I want to introduce again Christian Duprat, who's going to tell you about a book that a woman called Celeste Lotigier has written for school children, and we're going to see some slides of that running in the background. Christian. Yes, dear all, um, I would like the slide on the screen, please. Um, you know, children are the most important thing that we have, and we need them to learn about agroforestry and trees. And that's why we have a book for children in preparation by Celeste Lotigier. Celeste, could you come here? And she, has, she is drawing nice aquarelles, and there is a very nice story about a tree that doesn't want to stay in the forest, and he meets very strange conditions, and he has a lot of adventures. So that will be, there are other slides, please. And so that would be a, a, a new way to propagate agroforestry with our children. Thank you. Very good, thank you very much. Uh, beautiful images. And I think we're going to see, are there a couple of more of those slides? I think they'll be running. Um, maybe we might see another few slides. Um, now, also, um, I want to introduce another guest who is from World Agroforestry. I think she has a little bit of news for us. So, Stella Muazia, are you in the room? And if you can join me on stage, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy and excited to stand in front of you at this very moment to announce that the founding board members for the International Union of Agroforestry have been elected. This board will dissolve itself after a period of one year to hold fresh elections. The purpose of this board is to register the organization to define the governance structure and identify funding sources. Uh, the board members, and if you're here, if I call your name, just stand up and wave. Uh, Ayi Kofi Aden, uh, Patrick Worms, Esther Gebra Castro, Arun Komar Handa, Ingrid Oborn, Delia Katakutan, Maria Rosa Losada, Lee Winowiki. Now, the board held their first meeting to elect their leaders as follows. The chair is uh, Christian Dupraz, the co-chair is Asta Gebricasto, the secretary is Ali Winowiki, and the treasurer is Patrick Worms. Uh, Christian, please come up and say a few words. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Stella. Uh, it's a great honor and a lot of a big charge for the future, but we will do our best. Uh, please note that it's only a provisional board uh, we will have regular elections as soon as possible. You are all invited to be members. You will be all invited to elect the final board when we have set the association uh, on, on its track. So welcome to the new association. Welcome to, new as, to you as members and long life to agroforestry. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. So we're going to go very quickly to our final plenary session, and it's a hugely important topic. It's about the roadmap for agroforestry, and it's my pleasure now to introduce the chair of this session, Eric Hoffner, who is from mongabay.com, which is an environmental online resource, and it has four bureaus. Eric is based in Massachusetts, and as I found out yesterday, he has his own land of seven acres with forests as well in Massachusetts. So he's very well placed to chair this mm -hmm. final session. Eric, I'll hand over to you to introduce your guests. Thank you, Karen. What a great, great way to bring this day towards a conclusion. Uh, talking about a roadmap for agroforestry, 
Um, I'm so inspired by everything that's going on, uh, the inspiration, uh, the information, all of this coming together. Uh, I'm just feeling really uplifted right now uh, by this group and I just want to thank everybody for being here and lending your talents and your enthusiasm and your optimism to this, uh, this great big challenge we have. Um, and this challenge in the next session is to wonder what the roadmap towards building a real implementation of agroforestry worldwide would look like. And we've got a really great panel here to my left and right. And um, I want to start by introducing on the end over here, we have Roger Leakey. Roger, uh, you know, he's, he's literally written the book on um, agroforestry. He's, um, he's been uh, the research director for uh, the World Agroforestry Center through most of the 90s when he was also an agroecology agro -ecology professor at the James Cook University. And um, he's the author of, most recently of um, Multifunctional Agriculture, Achieving Sustainable Development in Africa. But I think I've read all of your books and I think I've reviewed them all for different publications at this point. Um, next to him we have John Munsell. John is a professor of forest resources at Virginia Tech University. He's an associate editor also of a journal called Agroforestry Systems. And he's a past president of the Association of Temperate Agroforestry. So that's a really nice addition to our group. Uh, next to him is Patrick Worms. Patrick is president of the board of the European Agroforestry Federation, URAF. And he's also senior science policy advisor for the World Agroforestry Center, and probably no stranger to anybody in this room. He also has a host of other relevant experiences, and he's, he's gonna uh, share quite a bit with us, I'm sure. Over here, I've got Stephen Briggs. Now, he brings real good practical experience to us as a farmer in the UK. He's also a principal of Abacus Agri, which is a sustainable farmers, uh, farming consultancy there. And uh, I take it he, he farms 110 hectares of um, fruit and veg and cereals and uh, combines apples with this whole scenario. So I think that sounds quite delicious. Um, next to him, we have Jose Ruiz Espy, who's a policy officer for the European Commission for Agriculture and Rural Development. He's a, an agronomic engineer too, and he's plied his trade all over the place, including in the Republic of Guinea. Um, and on the end here, we have Emmanuel Patel. He's also with the European Commission in that same division, and he acts as team leader. Thank you for being here. And finally, we have Fergus Sinclair. He is leader of system science at World Agroforestry Center, and he's on the faculty for the Natural Sciences Division of Bangor University. He's really known for bringing his systems thinking into agroforestry and uh, giving people a sense for everything from field to farm to the landscape scale. So we're gonna be leaning on you, sir, for your systems thinking. To get us going, uh, we wanna tap the dean really of, of, the, uh, of the group here, Roger, to give us a, his 10 minute synthesis on what a roadmap for agroforestry would look like. And it's no small challenge, but he's up for it because he's optimistic and he knows his stuff. So please welcome Mr. Roger Leakey. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and thanks to the organizers for allowing me to come and talk. Um, I'm going to basically be building on what we heard in the last session, I think, for, particularly from Tony, uh, and also building on Dennis's enthusiasm for products, which I think is relatively new, but he tells me it isn't. So, a, a roadmap then, and how do we go forward, uh, with, and perhaps with a bit of unexpected vision. 
So I think we need to advocate agroforestry as a way to intensify tropical agriculture. I think agroforestry is often seen as being low-tech, unintensive, and I think we really need to change that image. So how do we get everybody on board? Um, maybe we need a few more trucks. Um, so agroforestry is a, a very diverse set of practices and purposes. It's intricate, it's multifaceted, multidisciplinary subject that can be delivered using hundreds of different species in infinitely variable configurations across a wide range of geographies. And that, I think, is very difficult for policymakers and many other people to uh, really get their head around. And we need to help them to understand that. So what is agroforestry? Well, we've heard several definitions during the course of this week, and we've also heard that there are many problems in actually defining agroforestry. And so I'm going to throw another one into the pot. I, I see it, and it was published in 96 and repeated in 2017, as a process of creating an agroecological succession, leading to a mature agroecosystem that is also highly productive. And in order to achieve that, again, I've mentioned many times in various publications, a three-step approach to agricultural intensification that builds, firstly, on step one, the ecological services that are delivered by trees, both through nitrogen fixation and also through the diversification of the uh, agroecosystem. And then secondly, in steps two and three, how do we get uh, better results from the, a very wide range of products, uh, from a, again, from a very wide range of, of trees that have been traditionally important uh, to hunter-gatherers. And those last two steps, I think, are crucial to generate income. And so the, the overall model, I guess, is we need agroecology plus income to get productive agriculture and intensive agriculture. So, the first step, I think, in all of that is how do we solve the almost immediate problem uh, of the, uh, this downward spiral in land degradation and social deprivation. And um, we really got to turn that spiral on its head uh, and reverse it. So instead of poverty driving land degradation, this is that's an, obviously an extremely simple, simplified explanation of the issues, uh, we need to, to get land rehabilitation uh, stimulating and driving enhanced livelihoods and then that in, in turn driving land restoration. So we're trying to turn this spiral uh, upside down. Now, one of the problems that arise from that spiral is what's known as a yield gap. That's the difference of, between what's the blue line on this graph at the bottom which is the actual yield that farmers achieve, in this case in, for a maize crop in Africa, about one and a half tons. Uh, and the other, the other extreme, the potential yield of, imp of improved maize varieties, which are something like 7.5 to 8 tons per hectare on a research station. So that leaves us this massive yield gap. And that, these are the average figures for the whole of con the continent of Africa. So I think this three-step approach is based on the need to restore agroecology and to generate income because the income is needed to get steps two and three going because farmers need to be actually able to buy inputs. So what I think we can see if we fill that gap, we could probably get an increase in staple food crop yield of three to 600%, which of course is massive. Um, and then by default, in effect, that, that uh, increased yield would mean that we could grow our staple food crops on a smaller area of land, and that would take pressure off the forests, uh, and so is good for biodiversity and the mitigation of climate change. So I want now to go forward and think a bit more about where we might go with agroforestry. So I think the first thing we need to think about is we need to challenge donors, development agencies, agribusiness, and emphasize that the so-called inevitable trade-offs that they often talk about and say they are not acceptable in modern agriculture and that agroforestry can actually deliver sustainable intensification without those uh, trade-offs. 
So I want to introduce the idea of land maxing. You've probably heard of land um, sparing and land sharing as two um, scenarios for land use around the world. But land maxing is one that I've just put forward in the last few weeks in a, a journal uh, published in the journal Planter. It's how do we see that we can maximize food security from that small area of intensive agriculture in the middle of this photograph um, to get food security and maximum food security and then also build into all of that the agroecological functions and the creation of wildlife habitat and carbon sequestration that would come from a much more diverse series of tree crops uh, within the landscape. And then through the domestication and commercialization of those agroforestry tree products, generate income and generate new business, lo local business and local industries, such that we get real money coming out of what in effect will look like uh, a tropical forest. And I think if we want to do that, and if we're going to do that, then we have to sell this as, being, as building on the Green Revolution. I don't think that's a problem. We are building on the Green Revolution. That bit's going to happen right there in the little green bit in the middle. But we need to diversify the whole thing with staple foods, orphan crops, uh, and with a range of old and new cash crops. So how do we achieve those improvements in the, uh, in the products? Well, ICRAF started a program way back in the mid-90s of what it called participatory domestication. It was a decentralized process that was a bottom-up grassroots incentive system that led to self-help, self-sufficiency with self-confidence. And the output of that participatory domestication is what I've called socially modified organisms. That's to compete with GMOs. So this is an approach which we picked up because the, the farmers, this is what the farmers said they wanted. When we asked them, what do you want from agriculture? They said, we want to cultivate the species we used to gather from the forest. And so now those uh, products are what we're calling agroforestry agri tree products. They are not common property any longer. They're now private property. Uh, and so they're different from the non-timber forest products that we're often talking about. So currently we have about 50 or more species engaged in this kind of a process around the world. It's actually a number that grows weekly. Uh, just at the moment, new articles come out in the, in the press from different countries all over the world, often driven by um, universities and NARS, particularly in Africa, who are suddenly seeing that there's real opportunity here for them. So these products, uh, in addition to generating income and providing highly nutritious foods, um, rebuild natural resources, natural capital, perhaps we should call it in the light of the last talk, diversifies agro-ecosystems and markets and promotes traditional knowledge, culture and gender at equity and occasionally picks up the odd award. So once you've got those trees producing their high quality products, then of course we need to be processing them, value adding uh, and getting the markets functioning properly. And so we can move, I think, from the left-hand picture of a traditional market stall in, in West Africa, in this case, through to cottage industries and to more sophisticated systems of, uh, of, of preparation and, and um, scaling, um, value-adding of, of these sorts of products. I want to emphasize here the cottage industries as, a, as an intermediate step, because I think in the session with the private sector the other day, Monday, um, it wasn't clear to me that, that, that they were really seeing this as an important step. And I think if we're going to get subsistence farmers up the first couple of rungs of the, of the ladder into the cash economy, then we have to have a, this, this crucial cottage industry step in this process. And if we go down that route, then I think we can see we're moving towards a green industrial revolution for Africa and picking up on the old adage that agriculture is the engine for economic growth. And I just want to highlight the two pictures on the right, which are existing examples of this kind of approach, one in Cameroon and one in Botswana. So in this list of outcomes, again from the project in Cameroon, we see a whole series of things which I think would normally have been considered to be the trade-offs of, of intensified agriculture. And 
what I'm suggesting to you is that if we really do this agroecology plus income generation correctly, we can actually get these as positive impacts once we get that far, but they certainly can be outcomes which I think we can then see as trade-ons rather than trade-offs. And again, that uh, concept has been recently published. So what we see then is that the farmers themselves are, are very excited by this kind of process. This is something they asked for. They're now seeing it. They can deliver it for themselves uh, and it's meeting their needs. And the sorts of things they say are written in the blue bubbles here, but I want to pick up on the two that are highlighted in yellow because I think those are the two probably the most exciting in terms of what we're talking about. The one on the left saying, I've decided to be a nurseryman and stay in my village. That means not migrating to the town. That means perhaps not getting in a rubber dinghy and trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea. The other one on the bottom right, I'm processing and trading tree products. That means they're also generating income and getting up into the, up the, the ladder into the, the cash economy. And so those two things I think are crucial to what I want to say next, which is that as we go to, to land maxing, we really have to see that agroecology has to embrace homo sapiens within the system as the top predator and the top herbivore and meet all of them. If we aren't meeting their needs, then the whole system is not going to function properly and it won't either for the people uh, or for the planet. And if we got all of that right, and that obviously is a difficult thing to do, but it's, I hope it's where we could be going on our roadmap, then we can see that there may be opportunities for agroforestry to actually pick up money from the peacekeeping budgets. Because if you overlap the uh, issues of hunger and, and poverty on a map of the recent armed political conflict, you see remarkable synergy. And that means perhaps that, and there's some evidence to support this in the literature, that hunger and poverty are actually some of the drivers behind uh, social and political conflict. And so perhaps we could start to address that and get ourselves a new source uh, of money. And that money, I think, is crucial to the next thing here, which is this is a, a blue line is the current situation in terms of the median income per day by country for the, all the countries of the world. And you will see that the black line down the middle, which in effect is the median of medians, and the whole of Africa, all the countries of Africa, fall below that median. And that median is $7 a day. That's two cappuccinos down the road. So we really have to get this uh, divided world, and this inequitable world, much more equal. And I think we've got to bring this blue line up to the, to the red one or the brown one, whatever color it is, and perhaps even above it if we can. If you want to know more about all of that, somebody's mentioned already that I've been writing books. Here they are, the left-hand one for non-academics and the right-hand one for academics. And so, um, after 13 years of retirement, I think it's time for me to hang up my boots. It's over to you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> not so fast, Roger. We're not letting you retire. Oh, well, our systems thinker, I'm sure, has his uh, wheels spinning over here. What do you, uh, what do you make of, of the roadmap and, and Roger's ideas as laid out so far, Fergus? Uh, is this working? Yeah, it is. Well, uh, it, it's just as well you've retired, Roger, <clears throat> because uh, I, I think things are, are, are really moving in some of the directions that, that, that you've been uh, suggesting. But I, the, there were a couple of key concepts that I think we need to be careful about. You made a lot of noise about intensification, but I think it matters how you're intensifying and what you're intensifying that really makes the difference. So you can be capital intensive, you can be uh, fossil fuel <laughs> intensive, uh, uh, Right, but, 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 but the language is careful because, you know, the sustainable intensification debate is very much focused on higher production per unit of land, whereas the agroecology 
debate is far more uh, about recycling, about more efficient use uh, uh, of things. You often end up with higher productivity in the land, but that's not the objective. Um, and I think we need to be quite careful about not confusing these things uh, and ending up with uh, uh, pushing um, for uh, particular technologies which may or may not um, um, uh, deliver. And then we, we need to think about the different levels and the metrics that we need in order to understand whether our systems are performing uh, uh, sensibly. And, and these are scale dependent. So at a, 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 the, the farm or the livelihood level, we're really thinking about total factor productivity. And that's where your concept of yield gap can be a little bit of a problem. Because we focus quite often on just the yield of one thing. You know, like how, how many tons of maize per hectare do you get? But if you've got a lot of different crops on your land, then obviously you're interested in the land equivalent ratio. You're interested in uh, 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 what is coming out. And of course, if somebody's livelihood is not just agricultural, but also includes other things, then you need to actually understand what the impact of different interventions are on that total factor productivity. Then you've got your landscape scale. So when you integrate up, so you've got lots of farmers in the landscape, you've got a whole series of ecosystem services. And Meiner van Nordwijk published this very nice uh, 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 concept of a land equivalent ratio multifunctional uh, um, uh, equation that gets a societal weighting for each of the ecosystem services, the, producer, the, the productive ones, the regulating ones, and the cultural ones, and then adds up. What are you doing, not only for an individual yield, but for the, 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 the total impact on the environment? And that's critically important. The EAT Lancet report has come in for a lot of um, uh, uh, criticism, but it's pointing to a really important aspect, which is also, it's not only production that matters, it's also how much people are consuming. So we need to think about a food system metric, which is likely to be something like an ecological footprint, in which you're taking into account how much people are consuming and whether there is the bioavailable land and water resources to produce that. So as we go up those system levels, we need a broad set of metrics that allow us to see whether or not we're being sustainable. And What's very exciting about what's happening now, if we look at the, the, the it is large scale experimentation with farmers. So we've gone beyond participatory action research, which tended to be with a relatively small number of farmers, to doing participatory research, but with a large number of farmers. Large. large millions. So what we're talking about is actually operating research at the scale of impact. And the reason why you need to still be doing research, because often people think research is something that you do and then later you do practice. But what we're doing now is shifting that and actually embedding research in development practice. So what you're doing is understanding the variability of farmer circumstances, the complexity that you're talking about. Lots of different tree species, lots of different soil types, lots of different family sizes, lots of different um, um, income generation possibilities. And if we're going to capture that, we need to use modern information technology, but in the service of the small farmer and, and, the, and understanding the heterogeneity so you can match a variety, a diverse set of options to the individual context that people actually face. And I think it's a really exciting agenda. Hmm. Thank you, Fergus. Can I respond? Please. <laughs> yeah, I, One I, minute. I don't disagree with, all, with almost any of that. Um, the problem is that you can't save all that in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, I want to bring it back to practice a little bit. Uh, the, the roadmap, as, as we've just looked at, is, is more welded um, visually and, and practically on, on uh, tropics, but uh, uh, John here, John Munsell with the Virginia Tech, uh, you and I had some conversation about what, what, what this kind of 
what this conversation means to temperate regions as well, because that's a large part of our planet. And um, you're, you're involved with um, some of that uh, road mapping in North America, and you, you're watching and, and, and nurturing some things. So wh what is your takeaway? Well, thank you, Eric. Um, thank you, Roger and Fergus. Um, so what I'll try to do is uh, cut down the middle of uh, the dialogue and maybe uh, capture some of the salient po points from uh, both of your remarks and find a, a common landing place with respect to examples of what I've observed in North America regarding the um, decentralization of agroforestry, uh, organization around the framework of agroforestry and action as well. And um, when I think about scaling up, and um, I, I captured that theme with your presentation, Roger, uh, I also think about scaling out and down. And um, when we think about the context that Fergus mentioned, that's very critical because these problems, and really in terms of the way I see agroforestry playing out in North America, uh, are related to problems, not necessarily um, poverty. We do have impoverished farmers, but what we have is a lot of degraded and exploited landscapes that have produced food with chemical inputs for quite some time and are in much need of rehabilitation. So you mentioned rehabilitation. Uh, at the community scale, that's where the creativity happens. Uh, agroforestry, in my opinion, is a problem-solving framework. It's complex, but in that complexity is where we find creativity, and that creativity is centered in community. And so the people within a decentralized system uh, rightfully so deserve autonomy, and we can continue to support them as individuals involved with institutions, but we need to be comfortable also with the spread of agroforestry in ways that are not associated with our nudges, but are happening organically. And I think that will then capture some of the essence of what Fergus has described in terms of being able to apply that framework in a creative way with all of its complexity to address the very local and immediate salient problems that these communities are addressing. And so when I think about um, what's emerging in North America, there are non-governmental organizations such as Savannah Institute, uh, really born of their own volition that have taken on the agroforestry mantle. We have peer-to-peer -peer work through farmers that are expanding. Now, I know there's a great history in the tropics in that regard, but we haven't seen much of that in the temperate setting, but we're seeing more of that. Interlace Agroforestry uh, Farm would be a good example as well. And even some of our institutions are pushing for decentralization. Uh, a flagship center at the University of Missouri uh, has an agroforestry academy where they're engaging state and local level agency officials, training them on agroforestry and letting them move on into their locales to continue that work. Uh, we also have our USDA National Agroforestry Center, uh, which is pushing for regional working groups. So we have now seven or eight regional working groups across the country. So we're not talking about centralizing and institutionalizing, okay, because scaling up can lead to that, which then, you know, if you think about Richard Norgard's book, Development Betrayed, necessarily defeats creativity and community collaboration. But we're talking about spreading and opening the wings and allowing for that autonomous work to occur and uh, continue to promote the framework through communication and dialogue. Thanks, John. Yeah, and you're in the Mid-Atlantic, I'm in the Northeast, and it's similarly decentralized there, but there are a lot of people who are talking about it. There's even a, a planner in my county who's, uh, who's looking at uh, raising money for, for agroforestry uh, projects locally. So. Uh, we can, I think we can approach that from, from different angles. Um, so, Karen, yeah. do you want to? Well, I, I think actually probably in the interest of time, maybe we'll sweep around and get views from everybody from the panel mm -hmm. and then get some reaction because I'm conscious we may run out of time because I think th the conversation is, 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 is very interesting. If we just get maybe a reaction from everybody on their points okay. and then go out. Yeah, sure. I guess um, then staying with temperate, um, why don't we, why don't we uh, hear from Steve? Um, really love to hear your perspective as a farmer in the UK, and I wonder well, what it's like, both demonstrating it yourself as as in growing, um, but also being a, an extension agent, as it were. You know, uh, having clients who who come to you for advice. What are what are the, any of the their feedback, and how did they react, and what are the barriers to getting your peers to accept this as a practice? Eric, thanks. Um, so I, I guess I pose a question 
back to you, which is, you know, we've heard, we've heard an awful lot, lot about uh, the benefits of agroforestry and the research that underpins uh, 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 a lot of that um, thinking. And, and I, I totally sign up to the need to have research to provide evidence to, to drive policy. But I think we're at a point in time now where, at least from my perspective, is actually do we need more research? What we need is more agroforesters. And, and I think the, 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 the challenge is that farmers, I'm a farmer, but I, I do read research papers, but the majority of farmers don't. And I think what we actually need is a coordinated effort in terms of more global, regional and local demonstration of agroforestry uh, to, to show farmers uh, the benefits and, and how actually agroforestry operates. Because in my experience, farmers learn best from other farmers and, and seeing is believing. Now, reading is not believing, seeing is believing in the flesh. And, um, and that, you know, we heard about research in the previous plenary session and in, in this session. Um, in my experience, a lot of research is, sorry, a lot of activity on farms is running ahead of research and that research is having to catch up on innovations on the ground. And farmers are the, are the consumer innovators. They will find ways to th make things work uh, because their livelihoods depend upon it. So, you know, from my perspective, in terms of a roadmap, I'd like to see a coordinated approach to actually showing farmers how it actually happens on the ground. Because I think the, the information is there. Uh, we just need to make sure that it's in a palatable form, uh, that farmers can see it, touch it, and believe it. Uh, how about uh, Patrick, Patrick Worms? You're with uh, URAF. Um, do you have um, a reflection on the roadmap in general and perhaps Stephen's thoughts from his area? Hearing the first three speakers, I felt I was in a group of friends. I felt that everybody here would agree with that because it reflects the complexity of what agroforestry is in real landscapes. But I was reminded through some of the conversations, and including the last comment, that we sometimes have a tendency to oversimplify and fall into binary thinking. So for example, when we look at landscapes in Europe, we think of traditional agroforestry systems like the Montados and the Dehesas in the Iberian Peninsula, and modern agroforestry systems, such as some of the ones that have been pioneered around here. But there need not be a conflict between them. When we look at the financial world, we are looking at the sometimes monomaniacal goal setting, which is to get money every quarter from one particular commodity and focus only on that, uh, versus the more sensible approach to look at things holistically and to prepare holistic goal setting. So really what we are facing is a problem and a tension between complexity and simplicity. We know simplicity in natural systems is usually a mistake. A simple diet is an unhealthy diet. A simple landscape is an unproductive landscape. So if we recognize that, then we need to figure out how we actually deal with that in the wider context of human civilization, which is characterized by a lot of technology, by a a lot of regulations, by a lot of control, by states and by larger entities. And there, there are three things that I think we need to focus on, and possibly the most important one is the governance thing. As you know well, Stephen, in the European Union context, a farmer finds it very, very hard to be creative in, to use your words, John, because creativity carries a cost, and the cost can be huge. The cost can be losing your subsidies. And in an environment in which around half your income is linked to subsidies, perhaps the most important thing that we can do when we look at these systems of farm support is to figure out how to create a legal space inside them to let farmers be creative, to let farmers develop their own solutions so that they are measured and rewarded for the results they obtain, not for the species they have chosen or the number of trees they have planted or the brand of tractor that they have bought. Another thing has to do with marketing. Complexity is the way the real world works, but simplicity is the way the human brain works. Just do it. Three words that have built tens of billions of dollars of value for one apparel company. It's extremely simple, even though the business behind it is extremely complicated. And there, we are fundamentally guilty. If I use the words conventional agriculture or traditional agriculture, 
Most of you will think that this means, at least in the rich world, that this means the high input intensive industrial agriculture that has been uncommon in the last few generations. That is the result of a conscious marketing trick by the agricultural industry to label this revolutionary suite of green revolution technologies traditional and conventional. It doesn't matter whether you're growing wheat in France or pigs in, uh, in Spain or, um, I don't know, oil palm in Indonesia. If it's industrial, it's often labeled conventional. Whereas agroforestry systems, agroecological systems, come under a multiplicity of names. I have a slide that is collecting them and I have to keep on reducing the font size in order to fit more and more words in as I come across them. That's the second problem. The third problem has to do with the support that we give to agroforestry systems in the rich world as well as in the poor world. Farmers find it difficult to get access to the information that they need to de-risk their creativity, to de-risk the decision to add trees to their landscapes or to broaden their production away from a single commodity. And there are many reasons for that, and part of that has to do with the fact that research, this pace uh, what, what you mean, Stephen, that research is still required to figure out what is the optimal solution in this particular context. We don't always know that, and if we give the wrong advice, because agroforestry is complicated, we can actually make the lives of farmers more miserable and more difficult rather than more profitable and better. These, in my way, in, in my words, are the key challenges that we are facing, and what I find particularly interesting about them, being somebody who has started his interest in agroforestry in the tropical world and has now been entrusted by the Europeans to represent their interest in the temperate world is how similar these issues are across the planet, across income scales, across geographical scales, across climate scales, across soil scales. When you talk to a farmer in Rwanda or in Niger and you try to understand how they think about their investment decisions, whether the investment is capital or labor, it is not that different from when you talk to a farmer in England, in France, or indeed, I suspect, in the US. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, he was getting the policy there, and so I thought I would throw it over to Emmanuel. Uh, you're with the European Commission Directorate on Agriculture, and um, there's this agricultural policy development that you have working on, I understand, in the coming years. Can that be somehow part of this roadmap we're talking about? Is agroforestry part of, of the, the Commission's work? Mike's over there, yeah. Okay. Yes, um, I'm pleased to be there. Thanks for the invitation. For us, in a way, we, we uh, are in touch, in fact, with uh, various stakeholders uh, in Brussels, and we are uh, in touch with member states as well, because uh, they have a responsibility to implement a common agricultural policy. and. Um, we have uh, today a roadmap, I would say, because we need to design a CEP for the next uh, future after 2012, uh, 2020, sorry. Uh, each time we have, uh, in a way, the need to uh, reconsider, to negotiate again the budget, and uh, it's a big challenge for, for the CEP, because uh, common agricultural policy uh, uh, represents uh, 40% of the EU budget donc, uh, is a big discuss. But at the same time, we, 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 take, we take some uh, opportunity to consult uh, society and we know uh, there is some huge expectation. We, we try to participate in uh, uh, such a forum and we know, in fact, there is some initiative from the farmer community. Donc we need to take care about that in our C CAP, and we have some uh, international, commi international commitment, as it was mentioned during the session. And we, we have fixed uh, three uh, main objectives uh, in, uh, in uh, environmental and climate uh, scheme. Um, just we have to take care about climate change and climate mitigation. We have to preserve uh, uh, natural resources and we have to preserve the biodiversity. And for us, is uh, fundamental, and it will be the, 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 core, the key element in the next uh, CEP. Member States has to address this uh, three uh, specific objectives. But we have to take on about experience, what uh, we have done with Member States. Because until now, we say, okay, uh, EU has to fix some uh, objectives, we have to fix some uh, 
relevant uh, instrument to guide uh, the farmer on the ground. But at the same time, there is a critical uh, aspect against uh, Brussels, because we talk about Brussels uh, against uh, uh, European institutions, I would say, we need to have more flexibility, we need to have more simplification. That means in our uh, perspective, we want to say, we, we want to, uh, to play the game. We play the game with a ball, but we have to share uh, the responsibility with member states. And the time is coming to have more, in fact, transparency uh, for all uh, stakeholders, because we will have uh, transparency at EU level, what we want to achieve in terms of objective. We will fix some uh, 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 relevant instrument. But at the same time, we uh, request to Member State to have a, a CRP, CRP plan, a strategy in a CAP, how to address the environmental objective, how uh, to mitigate uh, climate change through some concrete action. That means after, uh, on the ground, they will uh, have a, a top-up approach as well, because uh, in member states, there is a central ministry, but they need to be in touch uh, with farmer community, with uh, farmer community as we have today, to uh, feed their program. And we, in the program, we, we will, uh, uh, we will uh, require some uh, uh, ambitious in terms of environmental purpose. And for us, it's important to remind, in fact, in our instrument, we have uh, two types of instrument. We have a compulsory instrument, compulsory requirement, we call that in our jargon conditionality, and we have uh, as well a possibility to have a further intervention through a money to incentivize farmer when farmer to sh wants to shift from a conventional agriculture to a more uh, sustainable agriculture. So we we'll have uh, both instruments in our CAP, conditionality and after some additional payment to uh, encourage farmers to go uh, further step. And uh, today um, there is two pillars, I, I go very detailed, but there is one pillar is a main uh, part of the budget, 75% uh, and in this pillar is a support for income for farmers. And inside of this pillar we, we request uh, to have a uh, envelope to have a certain share of this p first pillar dedicated for more environmental action. That means uh, the normal farmer maybe will have a reduction of the income due to the fact they will have a reduction of the basic payment, but in addition they will have more opportunity to, uh, to move and to uh, develop a better action on the farm. But after, the big challenge is how uh, to define this action, these practices, and after, how to control it. But I will stop there. Mm. All right. Thank you. Um, we're going to open it up in a moment for uh, questions and reflections from everyone here. Um, but I want to just stick with, um, with the European Commission just for a moment and, 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 and pick your brain about it, Jose. Um, you're also with the uh, Commission, and I wonder We've been bantering about um, this idea of research and how much do we need and um, how much more do we need. Is there an opportunity within the EU for more research that underpins agroforestry that could help um, with the yeah. implementation? Okay, just one, one comment before. The reason why there's two representatives of the Commission here today is not that we have a, a very big budget for, for travel. It's because uh, mm, agroforestry uh, in the Commission is uh, at the same time a policy topic and a research topic. I'm in the Research and Innovation Unit on, on DG Agri, and my colleague is in, in a policy unit. So, from the research perspective, I, I was a bit concerned when uh, Stephen mentioned that there was not real need for research and innovation in agroforestry, because I, that would mean that uh, I would be without a job in shortly. But, uh, well, I do think that there is some, some research to be done, and actually we are doing quite a lot of, of, of research on agroforestry. I'm also happy that the title for the session uh, is called A Roadmap for Agroforestry. I will explain why. Uh, so far we have tackled uh, agroforestry in research and innovation from different angles. We have been supporting uh, agroforestry uh, 
agroforestry agro projects um, uh, properly, so projects that deal with agroforestry uh, specifically, but we have also been looking at agroforestry for other many different points of view. Agroecology is a big topic for us, and agroforestry is a component of, of, of agroecology. So we, we are doing a lot to study agroecological approaches to, to agriculture. We're also looking at the bioeconomy, and bioeconomy is a way of increasing the, 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 um, the income that, uh, to increase the value that can be generated from the products of agroforestry. And we have a lot of research on bioeconomy, uh, uh, including on, on, on bio uh, forest, sorry, on agroecology, oh, sorry, on agroforestry systems. And we are also looking a, uh, a lot at the policy aspects and the socioeconomic aspects of, of, uh, of agroecology in general, so on agroforestry. I would like to mention another instrument. We have two instruments basically for research and innovation. We have Horizon 2020 and FP7, our framework programs, and we have a different animal, which is the European Innovation Partnership on Sustainable Agriculture, EIP Agri, which is quite original, and I think it ticks many of the boxes that you have mentioned today here. Uh, EIP Agri is, is an instrument that, first of all, promotes local innovation. So um, Horizon 2020 and FE7 projects are typically of European size. EIP Agri promotes local projects with local actors. It also follows participative, participatory approaches. So we want farmers and all the stakeholders in the value chain to participate in the research and innovation from the beginning. And it is bottom up. So we do not impose the research that has, that has to be done. Operators themselves are proposing the subjects. So we are doing quite a lot. If you look at all the activities, I did some, some research before coming here. We have done quite a lot on agroforestry. But uh, in the next period, we want to have a more strategic approach. So we have already in the Commission developed a strategy for agricultural research. It's a broad document in which we identify priorities for agricultural research in general. But we want to go a second level into this strategy. We want to develop roadmaps for specific topics. So we will develop a, top, uh, a roadmap, for example, for uh, digitalization in agriculture. We will develop a roadmap for uh, small-scale biorefineries. We are developing a roadmap for uh, agroecology. And we have also the idea to develop a roadmap on agroforestry. A roadmap will be a very short document for internal consumption that will guide us in our research and innovation activities. And in this way, will be consistent and coherent um, in our activities to achieve certain objectives. Yeah, so that's it. All right, thank you. Okay, so I think it's probably time maybe to take some comments and reaction from the audience. You've had a lot of different perspectives. John, you just want... Can I pose a question? Yeah, okay. Oh, okay, so we've uh, mentioned the farmer on many occasions. What about the urban dweller with respect to the roadmap that you're considering? More people now live in cities um, than live in rural areas. Is this something that's uh, being considered? and the role of agroforestry in built environments? That's a tricky question. Huh? Um, I mean, I have come here basically to learn. So I'm open to all suggestions. The problem is that we are DG agriculture and rural development, and rural agriculture typically takes place in urban areas. So let's try to see how does, could that fit into our strategy. I'm not uh, closed to this, to this uh, possibility, but uh, to be honest, it was not in, in, in my mind uh, from the beginning. Okay, so who would like to ask a, a brief question or make a very brief comment, and if you can, keep them very brief. Do we have, yes, there's, well, you, you have spoken already, but I'm just wondering, is there anybody else who hasn't spoken who would like to raise a point? Oh, yes, and in fact, we have a tell Higone, who was the person Dennis was speaking about. This is the lady from Mighty Earth. She is the campaign director whom Dennis was talking about and highlighting. I think you were out of the room and Dennis mentioned you. Yes, okay. Thank you so very much. I would like to make a proposal and also ask all of you a question. <laughs> My proposal is that we go big or go home. 
And I say this because we're in an insect apocalypse, right? We've lost 80% of the insects in the places that we know about and probably more in the places that we don't know about. We're in a mass extinction, right? And we're all aware that industrial agriculture is the biggest culprit for that. So how can we think about transforming the entire coffee industry, the entire cocoa industry, the entire banana industry, doing this at scale so that the next agroforestry conference in four years' time, we're not talking about five hectares or five million hectares or a couple farmers, and I, I don't say this in a disparaging way. All the work that everybody has done here is fantastically important in building the knowledge and the information and the models that we need. But how do we do this at scale now in this emergency? Everybody here coming together to make it global. Thank Brilliant. Thank you very much, Atel. Okay, I mean, we won't have time for all of your responses. But who wants to take a response? Yes. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I really, that, that's a really great challenge, isn't it? Go big or go home. And a lot of what we're talking about is smallholder farmers, family farmers. And uh, I, I think we, we really need to be careful because these slogans are fantastic. Yes, we want to have a big impact, but that big impact means lots of small <laughs> uh, enterprises, small farmers, family farmers being empowered, uh, being able to do uh, and, and, and retain uh, um, uh, more people in, in, in landscapes and have a trajectory, particularly in countries that haven't already uh, completely industrialized uh, uh, their agriculture, to have alternative pathways that keep more meaningful uh, labor in the, the rural area, more uh, uh, um, uh, vibrant communities um, um, and, and business opportunities associated with uh, um, farming. So I, I think we need to be careful about this. I, I understand what you mean, uh, but, but let's be clear. This idea that agroforestry is some sort of little marginal thing on the, the edges is complete nonsense. More than around about half of agricultural land globally has more than 10% tree cover. It's just that people don't see the trees. They are there and they are important and they're providing important services. So we are already big. And the question is uh, uh, getting bigger and using those resources uh, in, in a much better way. Now, I, I really want to have a, an argument with, with, with Stephen here because... because no, no, he's, he's, <clears throat> no, no, we, we can do that later, but, 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 I, 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 but, because he's actually put his finger on a really critical thing. Yes, f it's not a question that research is over here and farmers are over there, it's the farmers who are doing the research, and that is the type of research that we are now doing, is co-learning together with farmers, it's not about a, a separate issue, and this, this idea, and it's, it okay, really so let, let, let's just get Stephen's uh, perspective on this. Oh, I'll just Stephen, finish and then okay, I'll, very I'll, quickly, and then we'll bring in Stephen. No, no, but, and then yeah, John, yeah, yes. Sure. Yeah. Be, 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 no, no, because it's, it, it, sad, Patrick, okay. it, it saddens me that, that, we're, that, that you know, sometimes you have to try to hide the word research because it's like it's seen as it's not practically relevant. But the point is that if you embed research in practice, then what you do is facilitate faster impact. And research methods can really help uh, 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 practice. Okay. They're not different. Okay, Stephen and then John and then Patrick. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry if I dissed research <laughs> uh, or disrespected it anyway, but uh, it, it applied research and making sure that the research is relevant to farms and embedding farmers in the design of that research from the beginning is absolutely imperative. Get big or go home. I think the problem is that agroforestry we get at the research level. The problem is we're very good at, at hiding our experience of research and uh, sorry our experience of agroforestry under the shade of the branches and what we need to do uh, hence my my plea for more 
openness and demonstration about agroforestry at a global, local and regional level is we need to shout about it. We need to shout about it to the big organisations and the big corporates and let them, let them invest in the bioeconomy, in recycling, in um, uh, carbon trading, in, in shared land use uh, and outputs because actually there's massive opportunities out there for agroforestry at the moment but we've been too good at hiding those opportunities in, in institutions and in research organisations rather than actually making the connection between the farms and what they produce okay. uh, with, with organisations. Grace, John, yep. your views? Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Yes, uh, a perfect segue because we uh, refer to the farmer as the farmer or farmers. They are not monolithic. They are very different. My research tells me as much. We need to be very comfortable with different investment strategies. So in certain cases, context, small scales, there are different ways of communicating and investing in those projects versus large scale farming, the industrial size farming, which has long been considered kind of off limits with respect to agroforestry and its history in community development. But we have organizations, we have initiatives underway that are looking to leverage impact investment dollars which don't require a big return but are very concerned with the environment and, the, and the, the trajectory with respect to agriculture and I think we need to understand the differences in the farming base and we need to match those with the appropriate investors so that we can capture and scale as this uh, individual noted. Okay, Patrick, quick comment on that? It's always going to be about income for farmers, right? It doesn't matter whether that farmer has 10,000 hectares in Ukraine or half a hectare in Rwanda. It's about guaranteeing income and increasing income. To do that, farmers need to capture more of the value of the complexity that they're introducing into their system because complexity is more difficult to manage than simplicity and will have higher costs at least at the beginning. And to do that, I want to get back to, to, to a point that you made, Etel. We need to start thinking outside of our own box. We love the trees and we love the land and we love the soil and we love the crops and we love the animals. But how about thinking about social systems? In some environments, it's practically impossible to make an investment in the landscape in the form of, for example, a solar-driven water pump for irrigation because the only valid economic strategy for a local is to steal the solar panel before your neighbor steals it in, in, uh, instead of you. So we have issues of trust that we have to deal about. These are also essential in some of the industries that you mentioned. For example, I learned this morning that in Cacao in Côte d'Ivoire, there are very few community groups, most farmers are individual, and the few community groups that do exist are relatively poorly skilled at capturing the value, capturing the investments necessary to capture more of the value of cacao. And I'm sure that has to do with a problem of low trust in those societies. Why do we talk so much about trees? Why do we talk so little about the keystone species in any agricultural system from the humid tropics to the Arctic and the boreal zone and that keystone species is the humans, it's us. Okay, very good. So we had a gentleman here. So hosts, can we get the microphone and we have a lady here, okay? So was that lady, we'll just take this lady's comment first while the microphone is going over to you. So yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. This is Mina from Iran, the ZPAC, the national NGO. I have a comment only, maybe a proposal. Uh, I, I expect such event, you know, outcome uh, should be uh, mentioning or trying to mention and insert exactly the word of agroforestry into international commitments and treaties. I want to know how many international commitments, conventions, and treaties we have that exactly the name of agroforestry is there. You know, I'm saying that because for such, such countries like Iran, uh, strict countries uh, who are marginalized and, and uh, you know, full of smallholders with degraded lands that, you know, the people are hungry and, you know, they, they cannot wait for long-term income and need to be funded, need, need the finance, then uh, the government should be under, under big pressure like international commitment to recognize agroforestry and to, to insert that to the, inter, to the national regulation and to allocate enough finance and funds for that. Okay, thank you, thank you very much for that. Thank you. And we'll take your comment and then we'll go back to our panellists.
um, Jerry Lawson here from the Centre of Ecology in Edinburgh, but I've also worked in the tropics as well as temperate agroforestry. Um, and the, the, hanging this on a slogan or a potential new form of words, uh, mine would be something like forget about afforestation, uh, use agroforestation. Um, and I think that's important now because so many of the, the aid agencies and the national governments, particularly post the Paris conference, are still thinking in terms of UNFCCC speak. Um, they're still thinking in terms of afforestation and management of forests as being the solution to carbon sequestration. And not enough people are mentioning what can be done in cropland management and grassland management throughout the world in temperate areas and in tropical areas. And many countries are set up, the people that are doing the measurement and the reporting are ignoring the trees outside the forest. They're okay. ignoring the huge potential to expand that. So, so I, I, and I must perhaps direct this to um, specifically to our European Union colleagues, um, because the European Union has a target which it measures the efficiency of its new cap. In fact, it's several targets, but but most of those are called the area of afforestation established. And then a little bracket, a footnote. They say that afforestation includes agroforestry. It doesn't. Of, uh, agroforestry okay. or our agroforestation is taking place on, on agricultural land. No, it doesn't become forest land. Okay, so thank you so much for that. We have just about five minutes left. I think, European Commission, you might want to reply directly. So, Eric or Jose, perhaps on yeah. that. Um, yes, as regards the. the we will uh, have a monitoring of the CAP in the future, and uh, this monitoring will be uh, based on some uh, indicators. Yes, it's a big uh, challenge for us. We have to set, uh, maybe with your contribution, uh, relevant uh, indicators. We'll have impact indicator, result indicator, output indicator. And uh, in fact, uh, as you said, uh, agroforestry is not comp we, it's not completely mentioned, but anyway, uh, in uh, result indicator, we'll address uh, uh, soil, uh, organic matter, we will address uh, carbon sequestration, uh, we'll address biodiversity, so that means after uh, agroforestry could be uh, uh, the key element, to, one of the elements to address this uh, indicator. So we don't forget completely the agroforestry, I want to say. But for us, we Today, uh, we try to uh, encourage all farmers and uh, just not to promote one uh, practice in self, but we expect all kind of practice as uh, agroforestry, agricultural, uh, agriculture of conservation, all kind of agroecologic uh, practice will be in, recognized in our uh, approach, I would say. Okay, and who would like to comment on the Iranian contributor's point about agroforestry being brought into maybe the treaties. Patrick, yes, and Fergus, yeah. I'll be very short. I completely agree with you. We need to pepper all official documents with references to agroforestry so that at an international level, the word keeps on coming up so that people remember that this exists and that they have to put it in. At European level, for example, any time a farmer has to fill out a form to get a payment for something, there should be a box that you need to tick that says, are you doing agroforestry, and if so, how? Simply to socialize the concept, to ensure that the much wider world that is outside of this room begins to understand that this is important and it is something that needs to be done. Fergus? Yeah, I think we need to be very clear that agroforestry is not an end in itself. You're not promoting agroforestry because it's agroforestry. You're promoting it because it actually makes a difference to people's livelihoods, to carbon sequestration, or to whatever. And it's quite clear that, uh, that there is a problem with policy because uh, often agriculture and forestry are in different ministries, uh, energy is somewhere else, water is somewhere else. So actually getting integrated policy that makes sense is quite difficult. It is coming through, so there are, uh, agroforestry is mentioned quite a lot in NDCs, so it's coming um, um, in, 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 in that context. And there are also a number of very uh, clear examples of national policy. Uh, the, the World Congress uh, last time was in India, that, and, and they announced a national agroforestry policy. Nepal is, is in the process of ratifying its uh, uh, national policy. Rwanda 
has a, 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 a national strategy and plan to 2030. Uh, Ethiopia has a national scaling strategy uh, for agroforestry. So there are lots of examples of where these things are really happening and they're often connected to government uh, commitments like to land restoration, for example, the bond challenge, AFR 100, um, um, and uh, 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 the uh, 2020 initiative in, in Latin America. And these big commitments by government to land, rest land restoration are often connected to agro uh, uh, very explicit uh, elements for agroforestry. But we need to be realistic about the fact that you do need to support um, uh, development, sustainable agricultural developments, which have had much less investment, and it goes back to the research aspect as well. If you look at the amount of evidence that's available for how to do industrial agriculture, it's massively greater okay. because you've had the investment. So if we don't get investment in alternatives, you don't know what is the best way to go, and you need that initial investment to cover the lag between investing in ecological infrastructure and getting the returns from it. Okay, Emmanuel, I think you just wanted to comment very briefly. I, the microphone is there, yeah. And then... Yes, um, just briefly, because we, uh, I understand we, it's better to define agroforestry and uh, uh, it's a concern, but uh, at EU level, uh, this is my thinking. Maybe we can spend a lot of time to, that, to do that, to have uh, several workshops, and nobody will be agree on a definition at the end. And I think today uh, we have to be better consider the, the, real, uh, the reality of agroforestry uh, in the land itself. We have to recognize on the fact on the land there is a landscape feature, there is the edges, there is the trees, and when we have a public allocation, uh, money to allocate to the land, uh, we need to have another uh, view than that. We need to accept the fact in the land it's possible to have a trees and landscape fissure. And today it's not completely uh, admit, it's completely clear in the administration mind. We have to have a uh, revolution, cultural revolution, it's step by step, but it's a good time to have this uh, revolution, cu cultural re revolution in uh, the administration when you allocate uh, public money. Just okay. to recognize on the land there is a landscape feature. Okay, I'm under strict instructions to finish within the next few minutes, Eric. So I'm going to hand over to you to maybe sum up the, the debate. Uh, well, very good. Actually, I, I want to thank Roger for giving us a, a brave swing to the fences with the roadmap. And I, I wanted to ask him as, as the kind of the the lead off for this session is there is there a is there an institution that you think is capable of scaling up your vision um, the, I guess the short answer of that for agroforestry is that there is not an in, a single international institution that has that mandate um, there has been talk about trying to create alliances of all the various NGOs the, the African Alliance for the African Agroforestry Alliance for Africa, for example, um, but no funding was ever c came forward for that. Um, so I guess that's the main point. But if I can just pick up on some of the other questions, it seems to me that agroforestry is very much sustainable agriculture, and it, it needs more emphasis on the agriculture to increase the benefits to both the people uh, and the planet. And one of the areas of research that I think we need the most of is impact assessment. All right. Well, very good. Um, you know, I, we're, where we go from here is up to us, and it's, uh, I, I hope you guys will come up and, and, and pester these folks with more questions and, and see where we can get going, too. Okay. So. Eric, thank you so much for doing a super job. As again, you had an awful lot of panelists to try and cram in. And a big round of applause for Eric and his panelists, please. I know there were lots more hands up, but we have had packed sessions. But I do think that, Etel, you should be on panels and more women like you in the future. So I hope that, um, you know, we'll take on board the fact we need more women, our Iranian contributor. We need more women up here generally on these panels because perhaps that is going to lead to the kind of changes as well. Thank you so much. You're free to go.
And we're going to move quickly on because we're under such pressure to get through all of the material before we'll be thrown out of here. So now our next segment is a tribute to PK Nair. And to explain all of this, it's my pleasure to invite again Dennis Geraghty back up on stage. Dennis. Well, thank you, Karen. And um, <clears throat> may I um, now invite uh, Dr. P.K. Nair, his spouse, Nimala, and our colleagues, Daniel Mugendi and Jiro from Kenya, and Robert Miller from Brazil, to join me on stage here and take your seats, please. I see Robert. Is Daniel in the house? I think he's coming down. Okay. Mesdames et Messieurs, agroforestry is such an exciting and game changing paradigm for the future. Yet, we all, as we look forward, need to step back once in a while. It's fitting that we take a few moments to look back and to remember that some very special people have built the foundations of the strong edifice that we have today. Thus, I was very excited to be asked by the organizing committee of the Congress to put together um, a tribute to one of the great giants of the field of agroforestry, and by doing so, to draw out some of the inspiration and energy <clears throat> for our great struggles ahead. And as they say, you cannot know where you're going unless you know from whence you have come. And so in the next few minutes, let's take the chance to celebrate the life journey of one of our truly great agroforestry pioneers and to see what inspiration we can draw to instill in each of us the confidence to take things forward in the future. My name is Dennis Garrity, and I've had the honor of leading the World Agroforestry Center during the first decade of the 21st century. And I've had the pleasure of knowing and working with Dr. Ramachandran P.K. Nair for about 30 years or so. And that has been a pleasure, although with a few frustrations, because although P.K. Nair has taught me a lot, and he was always ready to point out to me and to other colleagues how we could do things better. In fact, for P.K. Nair, um, he is the guy that embraces the practice of tough love. Am I right? <laughs> well, if I may um, start from the beginning. Kerala, India, one of the great and inspiring gardens of agroforestry around the world was the home and the birthplace of Dr. Nair. And um, it is itself um, what probably inspired him to get engaged in the field of agroforestry, which had no name at that time. PK graduated with his uh, bachelor's and master's degrees in the early 1960s from Kerala Agricultural University. And he went on to Pantnagar, where he got his PhD, and studied the topic multiple cropping with rice-based systems. After his PhD, he went to the acclaimed Rothamsted experiment station in England, and he did further research on soil nutrient dynamics uh, in the famous long-term broadbulk fields. 
That must have been an experience. Now, he also studied in Europe and earned a second doctoral degree on systems analysis of nutrient cycling in coconut-based multi-story cropping systems. And he worked on the now famous multi-story cropping with the uh, resource sharing concepts when he was an employee at the Plantations Crops Research Institute in India in the early 1970s. And that was before there was a term agroforestry actually invented. Well, PK was one of the initial instigators of the World Agroforestry Center, or known at that time as the International Center for Research in Agroforestry. <clears throat> and you can see him inside that little yellow circle there uh, in about the third row back. Um, and he began uh, on the steering committee, but he joined the staff in 1978 and um, accomplished a whole range of pioneering contributions to the field of agroforestry during the next decade. Um, in fact, the one that is closest to my heart was his book on an introduction to uh, agroforestry systems in the tropics. This, that's the one you see on the bottom left-hand corner there, an introdu introduction to agroforestry, the most comprehensive analysis that you um, uh, that you had available uh, at that time and probably pretty close to the present. If you were to look at the number of publications that PK has contributed and the, um, the, the citations index, it's fair to say that he's probably or nearly the most widely cited agroforestry scientist in the world. He joined the University of Florida at Gainesville <clears throat> back in 87 when he left the uh, uh, World Agroforestry Center and established the agroforestry program at the university and has mentored and taught hundreds of students in the process um, from all over the world uh, in gaining experience in agroforestry. We all owe PK a particular debt of gratitude because he was the instigator of the series of conferences we now know as the World Con Con Congress on Agroforestry. PK, you organized the first one in 2004 at Orlando, um, Florida, and with my help, yes, I see myself in the picture over there, uh, standing beside or behind um, our great uh, mentors, uh, M.S. Swaminathan and Norman Borlaug. Beautiful, beautiful picture. And here he is with um, a group of the, of the many students that he has trained over the years, and I just wonder how many there are in this audience who have had contact with PK as a student. Must be tremendous. Dr. Nair has also gotten additional um, honorary degrees from a whole range of universities, which you see here, from Kyoto to Ghana, Canada, and Spain. He received in 2006 the Humboldt Prize, the highest academic honor that is given in Germany. And we ought to remind ourselves that um, PK is um, not only dedicated to agroforestry. He's a bit of a foodie also. And he and his wife, Nimala, uh, sitting next to him, opened up a restaurant in Tokyo back uh, when they were on sabbatic there some years ago. That was a piece that I didn't know about until recently. Um, and as you know, um, Nimala um, is a distinguished scientist in her own right at the University of Florida. And I'm reminded that behind, or actually sitting next to, every successful man is one astonished woman. And I wonder if she feels the same way today. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, we have asked a couple of PK's many students to share two minutes 
of brief remarks on recalling a specific remembrance from their period working with him. Uh, I asked them to be a little naughty and to share an anecdote that might give you a bit of the color of PK as a, nin a mentor and an advisor. So I'd like to call up to, this, to the podium um, Professor Daniel Mugendi and Jerry, who is now Vice Chancellor of the University of Embu in Kenya, my home country now, to say a few words about his relationship with PK. Please, Daniel. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gariti, and good afternoon. Um, I first met PK, we normally call him PK, in 1991. And then he became my supervisor when I joined the University of Florida from 1992 to 1997. So I had uh, about seven years of intensive mentoring. What I remember very vividly about uh, PK, there are many things I can say, but with the two minutes, I will say two or three things. One thing is uh, when I arrived, 1992-1993, I think about after two or three weeks, he called me to his office, and he told me, Daniel, you now got to forget the titles that you earned in, in, in Kenya. And remember, you are now a student, and work as a student. And that really helped me, because uh, in Kenya, I was uh, working for a, 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 um, a research institution where I was a research uh, scientist, and, and the people that uh, were around me that I couldn't, be, I couldn't be able to command. But here, I needed to, to learn to be a student. The other thing that I liked about PK is that uh, he always liked uh, pushing us into the deep end. I know one time uh, when I came from collecting my data from Kenya, and I came and I gathered all my data. I've been, I was away for seven months, and I went with all this data to him and prepared two copies, one for myself and one for him. And I gave it to him and I told him, here is my data, look at it. He just looked at it and asked me, so what do you want me to do with it? I don't know, I expected you to look at it, so that then you guide me, you tell me what to do. Then you asked me, it is your data. What is the story? In other words, uh, he wanted to be sure that uh, I knew what I was doing. And uh, then, lastly, I want to say that um, PK was a great, was a big defender of his students. I know when we were there, we were like over 20 of us at any one given time, and uh, he earned uh, a personal touch which and every one of us. And I knew one time when we, I went for my proposal defense, uh, one of the professors insisted that uh, I wanted to do things to do with agroforestry, angelo intercropping, soil fertility, and he said uh, this is now out of place. Uh, what will one uh, PH, one thesis do in, uh, when we already have over 100 of them. So why don't you do monitoring? And I remember PK saying, um, uh, Daniel has come here with a specific um, problem that he wants to resolve, so we have to allow him to do what he came to do. And I really am really grateful that uh, he allowed me to do, to do that. And lastly, I want to say PK is a great mentor. He has mentored me and uh, he has continued to do it. Even now, he is still mentoring me. And many a times I have to talk to him, you find that I'm the vice chancellor, but I still have to reach out to him for advice, and the mentoring continues. I'm so grateful that I was able to meet PK Nea. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, and uh, yes, we all know how PK is very, very talented at bringing us down a few notches from time to time. Well, Robert, uh, could you join, uh, join me and say a few words from your experience as a student of PK? Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Well, PK is rather well known in Brazil, uh, not just because of his important book, but also he's been there numerous times to help people and uh, give technical advice on agroforestry projects. 
So it was with great expectations that I went to Florida to do a, a PhD with him at the University of Florida. And as is usual for PhD students, I spent the first month taking that rather vague uh, research proposal that I had and, and working it up with literature review and experimental design and other important details. So I was somewhat taken aback when I, uh, uh, PK gave me back the proposal with the following comment, insufficient for a PhD project. <laughs> Well, I went back to our agroforestry lab and there was Daniel and I said, Daniel, what do I do now? And Daniel gave me a very simple answer. He said, ah, don't worry about it. PK says that to everyone. Just, <laughs> just, just put in another chapter or two and you'll be fine. Uh, which is what I did and I, I got my PhD. So uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, thank you, PK. Um, but that's not what I came all the way from Brazil to, uh, to talk about. Um, what I did learn from PK is something much more uh, important, I think more profound. On, on several occasions, I took some of my results to discuss with PK, and he would look at them and the idea and say, well, that's all very fine and good, but what are the principles underlying all this? And this sort of question can be a bit annoying if it requires you to write another chapter on your results. But over time, I've seen the wisdom of this uh, idea of looking at the principles uh, behind the agroforestry systems, whether biophysical or socioeconomic. And my experience in Brazil showed me that successful agroforestry systems, whether traditional or more modern developments, are always embedded in social, cultural, and socioeconomic context. And as such, when people try to transfer these systems uh, to other locations or regions, the results are often disappointing or failures. Uh, so in Brazil, at least, I think this is because people tend to look more at the outputs uh, uh, with a very more sort of optimistic outlook and don't give enough attention to the underlying principles. And so I, f I firmly believe that if we are to achieve what's the holy grail, the sangrao of agroforestry, which is scaling up and scaling out, uh, we really need to be looking at, at the principles. Um, so thank you, PK. Thank you, Dennis. And thank you, Daniel. <laughs> thank you all. So, Robert, you, uh, you came down a few notches that day as well, didn't you? Yes, yes. Well, uh, now uh, <clears throat> I'd like to, um, as, as common, um, give uh, Dr. Nair the last word. PK? Wow, that's uh, really, really wonderful. I can't believe that all these um, accolades and all these uh, th narrations that have been made by Director General Garity and uh, Vice Chancellor Mugendi and uh, uh, Director Ro uh, Robert Miller are all about me. Well, thank you all. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Daniel. Um, and and uh, let, to, to start with, I want to start um, with thanking the organizers of this great event. This is the fourth World Congress of Agroforestry, and uh, my long-term colleagues and friends, um, uh, Christian Dupra and uh, Emmanuel Torcobio and all the other people who worked with them, them have put up, uh, uh, presented a wonderful show. I hope you will all uh, agree with me that this has been the most successful uh, World Congress on Agroforestry, and I'm very glad that it's going from strength to strength. So thank you all very much, the organizers. And thank you, the organizers, also for, for this uh, tribute. This, this is something really, really great. Thank you all. Um, as you know, um, this is the uh, world, uh, a part of the world uh, family of agroforesters, and this is uh, my family. I, I'm so excited to be here. And um, as, a, as, as members of the family, uh, you're all very dear to me. But there's one very special person um, who has been my partner all these uh, 46 years, um, and, and none other than Vimla. 
And so um, we have been through a lot of thick and thin uh, in this fantastic uh, journey of uh, agroforestry. And you know, as, as Dennis said, uh, my journey, um, my involvement with agroforestry started not um, with the, actually before the invention of the word uh, agroforestry, you have heard that it was um, 42 years ago, uh, June 28th of 1977 to be exact, uh, that the steering committee that was set up by the International Development Research Center to initiate some sort of research uh, to, as an interface uh, between agriculture and forestry to address the problems primarily of deforestation at that time and see what we can do um, to address that issue. And I happened to be on that, uh, <coughs> that um, uh, committee, which uh, eventually became the, the, the steering committee for the establishment of what would later be known as ICRAF, and that's all history, as you know. And I still remember the words of um, John Bene, an indefatigable defatigable, uh, Canadian forester of Hungarian origin, um, a very soft-spoken person. Uh, so he was the leader of that IDRC team, and he said um, uh, in that meeting, uh, re he reminded us, you know, every day hundreds or even thousands of hectares of tropical forests are falling to deforestation. And if we can do something to, to control that damn thing, let us do it today rather than tomorrow. Obviously, John was very agitated, uh, disappointed with all the frustrations that he had to deal with the bureaucracy and whatnot in moving for, uh, forward with uh, something, uh, you know, something establishing uh, something uh, international. So um, <clears throat> then, of course, uh, deforestation, uh, we, we may not have succeeded in arresting deforestation, but we, as we move, moved along, I mean, we means the agroforestry movement went along. We also uh, got involved uh, with various other land management issues for which there has never been a dearth. Um, every time a new uh, problem arises, we will jump into the forefront saying that agroforestry for this, agroforestry for that, agroforestry for everything. Ladies and gentlemen, I wouldn't be surprised if someone comes up um, very soon with the slogan, agroforestry for re-electing or defeating <laughs> Donald Trump in the upcoming presidential election of the United States. So the thing is, agroforestry is being promoted for all sorts of things. And that, I think, um, has been one of our failures. But we haven't, we, I don't want to say that we have failed, but we have had some failures or disappointments. One of the problems I would say is exactly that thing. That we have accomplished a lot of things, but could we have accomplished more? It's, maybe it's a human spirit um, that you get what, a lot of accomplishments, but still you get disappointed. Uh, not disappointed, but you uh, always wish for more. Even Jeff, Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world, is still making more money, right? So we, people don't want to give up on, the, on what they are committed to. We probably could have accomplished a little bit more. Um, one of the reasons for this, I say, think, uh, for not rising to the full potential, I think, is that this uh, potential mongering. We always say, okay, agroforestry has a potential for this thing, that thing, that, and uh, you name it. And I think we have to um, temper it down a little bit and understand this, as <laughs> Robert said, we need to look in the, okay, how can we do? What are the principles involved in what we want to do what, or what we recommend or promote? I think that is very, very fundamental. I know adoption by, of agroforestry technologies by farmers and other land users and uh, all those things are very, very important. But there is also a small segment of people, most of, the, most of us of assembled here, have the scientific um, uh, uh, responsibility of understanding how these things can be studied, understood, and, and promoted better. I think that's where the challenge, one of the challenges is. And um, uh, all said and done, it has been mentioned here that we still do not have a, an institutional niche when it comes to academics or administration or whatever. We are still a handmaiden of uh, forestry or agriculture. 
So I know the time is uh, under severe stress. I don't want to prolong too much. I uh, wish to thank you all again very much. I know a lot of new faces and new people have come into agroforestry. A lot more new technologies and techniques and modern uh, methods are being employed in agroforestry research and development. And this is all very, very satisfying to me as someone, someone who has uh, been in, involved in this thing all these years. And uh, as the if I may say, the longest uh, surviving card hold, holder of agroforestry. I don't think that um, any of you will have faced that, the question as to oh, what the hell is agroforestry, which we had to face in 20 years or 30 years into agroforestry. Some of you don't have to face that sort of challenge. Um, many people don't want to show their ignorance uh, by, not, by saying that they don't know what agroforestry is. But anyhow, so that, that leaving aside all those things, I want to wish you, I wish you all uh, the very best in your endeavor. I know the, the bright, more prosperous days of agroforestry are ahead of us, and uh, I look forward to your accomplishing those things. I am, and all, the old God is, is moving out, the future is your waste, and I wish you all very best. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, PK, and uh, do carry on challenging us and bringing us down a few notches from time to time. You know, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> Steve Jobs once said that those who are crazy enough to believe that they can change the world are actually the people who do. PK, I think your career is a living testament to the fact that no, you're not crazy, but that you have contributed to changing the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in putting your hands together for a toast and celebration to our friend P.K. Nair. Please. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dennis. Mr. Nair, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, former students. Thank you, Mrs. Nair.